Good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending um, a really unique opportunity that we have worked hard to create. Um, we are, the theme for the day is Walking the Talk, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in Higher Education. And this has been a joint effort between Faculty Professional Development and the Staff Equity Committee. Final. He showed up the day of the final. Oh. <coughs> um, first, I would just like to, in general, thank everyone who has put a lot of time and effort into today, specifically the media department. They have really stepped up and they really have helped us make this day um, a day that we're looking forward to and we appreciate those efforts. Um, we hope that there are a range of topics in the schedule and through the, the workshop um, descriptions that you should find something to interest you throughout the day. We're looking forward to a conversation starting and continuing throughout the year. My, sorry, I forgot. My name is Christiane Warner and I am an ESL professor and uh, the coordinator for faculty professional development. And before we get started, or as we get started, um, we did a short film in the last couple of weeks uh, as the term began, and we would like to share that film with you. Um, and so, we'll do the film. Hi, I'm Christiane Warner, ESL professor and coordinator of faculty professional development. A few years ago, I had an experience with a student who was struggling in my class. He needed to do well in the final. He showed up the day of the final wearing the clothes I had last seen him in. We talked because he didn't take the final exam that day. He had lost his housing that week. He had not eaten in a day and a half. And all of a sudden, I realized that my student had greater needs than taking a final exam. This made me consider a concept I had learned in college, Maslow's hierarchy of need. The base or foundation of that pyramid is our basic human needs, food, shelter, sleep. Then, as the pyramid gets smaller, in the middle, a sense of belonging, being part of a community. And then at the pinnacle of that pyramid is critical thinking, creativity. As people who work in a community college, we want our students to be at the pinnacle of that pyramid. And the reality is, is that our students are struggling with the foundational issues. They don't have places to sleep. They don't have food on the table sometimes. And this is something that we need to learn about. This led to this project to interview Long Beach City College students and to ask them about the struggles they have, the issues that they face on a daily basis. What has developed is a series of interviews that profile our students, and it is time to listen to them. My name is Tatiana Lopez and I'm a student at Long Beach City College. I went to high school ha called Hawthorne Math and Science Academy and um, it's a prestigious high school. Um, it was very hard and um, getting into that school was hard enough but like you're surrounded with geniuses like kids that like are far off like way like more prepared than you thought you were and um, one thing that I did struggle was um, having low self-esteem. Um, I felt like nothing that I did, you know, at that school was kind of right, you know. I just had low self-esteem, you know. And um, so yeah, that was kind of like my life before LBCC. It was just going to school. I didn't really have a social life um, in high school. It was mainly surrounding myself with studies. This semester, I'm ASB representative of volunteer opportunities and I'm a president ambassador, and I'm also a member of TNT. I'm really involved in this school just because I grew to love this school. I feel like um, for everything it's done, I, it's my turn to give some of it back. Um, what's not so great about LBCC? Um, the enrolling in classes, you know, we, this school, because of its because LBCC is so alive and you know it's a beautiful campus it attracts a lot of students and because it attracts a lot of students it means that um, a lot of the classes get filled up and um, as a student here um, it's kind of a hassle to you know 
be waitlisted or not be enrolled because your class is filled and there's only three classes available for, you know, like for calculus. And, you know, it's kind of like frustrating when, you know, you really do need the class, you know, to get to where you want. I guess the downfall would be just um, enrolling in classes and um, just being waitlisted and not getting in. It's a horrible feeling. My name is uh, Anup Talukdar, but uh, my nickname is Andy. I prefer both names. And I'm a student at Long Beach City College. I was born in Bangladesh, and my city is uh, Chittagong. I'm living here with my parents, I mean that uh, uncle, my family, in Long Beach. I work two, do two jobs, and I'm a full-time student. It's very big chance to live in America. It's a, it's a dreaming country to me. As a, as a student, I have there's so much opportunity right here. And I can't get that opportunity back in my country. I study in the, most of the time in my, the Long Beach City College Library. Why? Because those places is very helpful, quiet. Mm -hmm. And they have a study room. And those study rooms takes like two hours, they give it to me. One hour, more than one hour. Mm -hmm. So that's very helpful. And i living in my my home, my home is not enough space for a study because uh, um, the place I live over there is so narrow and I don't have enough room and my uncle or parents, they're working over there, they're cooking, so it's make me nervous. <laughs> That's why I feel that I have to find different way to study and I come to the library study room. Their service service is some of them very not good enough. Like I, I buy it, I bought the, the parking for, for the course, but I can't park even right here. It's like five, six, seven days right here. I park only two days and other five days I have to find parking to the other place in the residence areas. Mm -hmm. There's so few parking space and more students. There's not enough students parking. The LBCC is, uh, is a great service for, for students who drop out or who want to build their majors. And also it helps the, as a second language speaker, these community schools that helps a lot to, to, how, to how to speak correctly, how to un communicate with people, and that shows your majors by the, your uh, studying skills they can have uh, to build your future. Hi, my name is Alexa Castañón, and I'm a student at here at Long Beach City College. Since I was a little boy, you know, it, it was hard to me because I was different from other, you know, boys in the community, so they always, like, take me out. Of, of their group, you know. But I always in my, inside of me knew that I was like a woman inside of me and I will always feel like a woman. I didn't start dressing up like a woman because at the time in Mexico, you know, and you know how I knew how people got killed because, you know, doing that. So I, I tried to hide it the best I could, but Everybody in the school call me names, you know, like all these ugly, you know, names. And even sometimes my family's, you know, friends, uh, like um, cousins or things like that, when they, when they used to call me, you know, name. But I used to, like, you know, live with that. It's hard for me, especially like, like having in the school for almost over 20 years, I think, since I went to, the, to Mexico, you know. First, I was afraid because the teacher doesn't gonna understand what I, you know, like, or maybe he gonna like crucify me because I was like my way, or because they can see my voice, you know, and you know, and it and it happened sometimes. With I got like one teacher I remember that sometimes she used to call me like he sometimes, even here in college, and that made me. And one time I went straight to her and told her, you know what, you have my um, ID card, and my ID card said Alexa, so please call me Alexa or she, you know. 
And then she um, came in and asked me, like, okay, I'm sorry because, you know, and I'm not used to this, to this, so this is like, you're my first student like that, and things like that. Most of the, my teachers, they, they work with me, you know, they always ask me who I am, and, you know, and sometimes even I feel proud when one, t one of the teachers come and ask me, how do you feel he be here, or how, you know, you know, Alexa, I have this question. How can you call a person who, who is acting like this? How do you call transgender or transsexual or this thing? You know, I feel, you know, proud of when some, one of the teachers come and ask me, which is the best way I can, you know, approach to someone who I'm not sure if it's a boy or it's a girl. How can I? So I feel, you know, for some teachers, they are, they're like, I like me and, they respect me who I am, and I'm happy with that. So. Hi, my name is Scott Precop, and I'm a student at Long Beach City College. The, the struggles a vet has in comparison to other students are, are, are numerous. Um, we have a term, your head's always on a swivel, um, meaning that I constantly have to look at every, you know, if someone walks in class, someone opens a door in class, someone, you know, grabs a water to drink, I'm aware of it. I'm, you know, I constantly have to know what's going on all the time, um, and it's like almost unconscious uh, or unconscious. I don't technically try to do it. It's a react, like a reflex that we have, you know, for our safety, and it's it's embedded, ingrained in us that we can't even. It, it's almost impossible to to change it. Um, another problem that I face is memory. I can't remember, you know, formulas. Um, specific details I, I can't I can't do it um, I have to literally I, I make up songs uh, I, I, I make up uh, uh, every you know images everything I could possibly do um, I, I can spend like four hours just trying to remember one specific definition and that is detrimental to to soldiers what I think is great about Long Beach City College um, has to be the teachers um, they're, 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 they're so passionate, again, they're, they're, they're just phenomenal. Um, uh, I, I keep in contact with almost, for the most part, like probably half of them. Because um, um, we just have a, you know, a good student, um, you know, teacher-student relationship, I guess. Long Beach City College has some hiccups. Um, there's only one specific counselor for our, that covers all the, all the, all the military pre people. Um, He's overwhelmed. There's too much. Um, I, I, whether he he will admit it or not, I don't know. Um, but he's there's just he, they need people. They need staff. Hi, my name is Kian Relaford, and I'm a student at Long Beach City College. My life before LBCC was basically working just to make ends meet, working jobs that were getting me nowhere and um, barely putting food on, on the table for my children. My husband's been unemployed since 2010. And when we moved to Paris, he got a job working for Target. But um, after maybe a month of being there, he was already part-time. They cut his hours to below part-time. So it was like, it wasn't even worth him going. We barely paid rent. I had to sell my van for one month to pay rent. Um, we're living with other family members in the city of Compton. Um, we recently uh, lost our house. We moved to Paris and we lost our house and we had to come back to, you know, to the area, to LA County. And um, we're staying with just family right now. Sometimes school is the only thing that keeps me going. That's why this semester has been really stressful for me because um, Usually when I'm in school, everything just, it seems like it just goes so smoothly. Everything just goes right. And this semester has just been so challenging and I'm, I was almost, I don't know, I didn't want, I don't want to say like I wanted to just drop out, but I was so discouraged because of how everything started the first week of school, you know. So it, it didn't make for, you know, a happy camper. But, um, it's just so hard and I've always been one to, like I said, pull in good grades or, you know, just be happy in school and this has not been a happy semester at all. Not at all. You know, even my friends are like, 
He don't seem the same. It's like I'm I'm not. <laughs> it's a lot going on right now, you know. I'm not I'm trying to get back there, but it's it's so much going on and I try not to wear it here. I try to keep my smile on my face, but it's hard. It's hard. Our students trust us. They are here for a brighter future. We look at our students, time after time, as data. We look at them by their race, their ethnicity, their gender. And this is an opportunity to walk the talk, to look beyond just the labels, and to really see the students for who they are. After finishing the interviews with these students, I have a newfound respect for who our students are and the fact that they get up every day and they fight to get here and they fight to stay here and they fight to work towards a brighter future. And I think that's what the conversation is about today is to understand who our students are when they're not here. Um, and the students that you saw in this film today will be part of that student panel. And so if you'd like to hear more about these students and more about their stories, because a two minute story is not enough to talk about anyone. You know, it's just a, 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 a one identity out of many, uh, many roles that they fulfill. Um, please attend that, that session as well. Um, but at this point, I would like to introduce President Oakley. He will be speaking on um, the theme for the day. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think that was a fabulous uh, start to this morning, and I want to thank Christian, so please join me in a round of applause for that great piece of work. I also want to take the opportunity to thank uh, the entire committee led by uh, uh, Vice President Rose Delgadio, who put this day together. I think this is truly uh, something that we need to do more often as we think about why we get up every morning and come to Long Beach City College. It's good to be reminded, and that was a great reminder. reminder. So thank you to, to Lee, to Rose, and to everyone who helped put this day together. Please give them all a round of applause. <laughs> Diversity's promise. Um, I think that is a, a very appropriate title for this morning. Uh, whether we, we come to this uh, uh, willingly or with passion, uh, we are here. We live and work at a campus that is the epitome of diversity. And we live in a community that's the epitome of diversity. And that is something that we should celebrate. That is something that makes us stronger. That is something that makes us great. And that is something that makes us the example of where the state is going and where this country is going and where this world is going. So let us take the opportunity to really think about that today, to think about where we are and what we represent as Long Beach City College. Uh, because whether we, we think about it or not, and I know many of us come to work every morning and are focused, focused on what we have to accomplish today and we lose track of where, what we're accomplishing in the future, for the future. And so I want us to all just take the time today to think about in our own individual roles, in our own individual jobs, what we bring to this equation, what we bring to the students that come here, as Christian said, that come here and trust us, and they fight to come here. This video is just, a great reminder of why we come to work here and how privileged we are to come to work here. And I realize sometimes it's hard to think that way, given the, uh, uh, the news that we hear every day, given the resources that uh, continue to be pulled out of our systems of public education, given the wars that we fight, both 
abroad and on our own land between ideals of where we should go, we lose track and it's easy to forget that there are students getting up every single morning fighting like heck to come here. And why do they come here? Because they want a better life. They want a greater opportunity. They want to change the future direction of their children, of their grandchildren, and it begins here. They believe it begins here. So I realize that we all come and have our own trials and tribulations, and many of you, many of us have experienced those on a daily basis. But let's take today to think about those that we serve, the students, the students that we just heard from. Because I know throughout your day, you see the diversity that we're talking about today. You see the best prepared students, you see the worst prepared students, and you see everything in the middle, and they bring everything that they are, every life experience, every home experience, they bring it here and they bring it with them. And it's our job to help them navigate through all that and get to where they want to go. That's ultimately our job, to help them get to where they want to go. So, why is today important? It's important because we not only get to reflect on our students, but we also give us time to think about how we can become a better institution to serve the diverse needs of the community that we are privileged to serve. And I know you've heard me say that that means continuing to build a more diverse and inclusive uh, college, and that is what we will continue to do. Every time we hire someone, we need to be conscious of where they come from, what ideals they bring to this college, and how they can make this college a better place. Does that mean that we hire by, by color, by race, by ethnicity, by ideals? No. We're going to hire based on what they bring to this college and how they're going to make the lives of our students better. How they understand the experience of our students. Because, and I'm sure you all know this, our student body is going to become more diverse, not less. Our student body is going to have more need, not less. If you follow the demographics of the city, if you follow the demographics of Long Beach Unified, they are clearly being reflected in the demographic changes we're experiencing here at Long Beach City College, and we'll continue to do so. So I thank you all for being here this morning, and I want you to really take the time to think about what you bring to this equation and how you as individuals and collectively as a college how we can make the lives of our students better through understanding the challenges that they face, understand, understanding the life experiences that they have, and even if we can't directly relate to those life experiences, that we at least consider those life experiences when we're interacting with these students and help them get to a better place. We can't make it all happen for them. They take responsibility as well, and as you saw from the video, they are taking responsibility. So the very least we can do is eliminate the barriers that we construct at times purposely. We can at least do that. We can try to make their path a little smoother, a little clearer, not easier in terms of the academic rigor we expect them to achieve but we can make it a little smoother, a little more transparent, and a little less onerous to get from A to B. So let's think about how we can do that. Think about how we can interact with our students, how we can interact with each other, because certainly the interactions that we have with each other bleed into our interactions with our students. So thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for the great work that you do and I'm really looking forward to our guest speaker. And for that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lee Douglas to introduce. So again, thank you for being here and have a great day today.
Good morning, LBCC. Oh, thank you. That was better than the response I expected. Thank you so much. I feel, feel much better now. Thank you, President Oakley. I'm so excited about today. This day has been a long time coming. And I think many of us have the same mindset that we want to make sure that our students here at Long Beach City College are successful. Whatever we can do to help them be successful. Like many of you, my desire is that every student that I cross paths with, they have, they have a, an experience that they can, they can leave from that experience being better for it. And that I too can be better for having experienced their walk with them. I was so moved by the student, the video that was shown just a moment ago, a moment ago, because those are many of the very same students that we see every day. And on this day, as faculty, staff, and administrators, we have an opportunity to come together as the LBCC family to see what can we do, what our role is to help those very students to succeed on their path here at Long Beach City College. Now, today I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our guest speaker today. Dr. Daryl Smith is a professor of education and psychology at the Claremont Graduate University. Prior to assuming her current faculty position at CGU in 1987, Smith served as the college administrator for 21 years in planning and evaluation, institutional research, and student affairs at liberal arts colleges. In addition to numerous articles and papers, she is an author or co-author of Diversity's Promise for Higher Education, Making It Work, The Challenge of Diversity, Alienation or Involvement in the Academy, Achievement, Faculty Diversity, and numerous other works. Excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry, I lost my place. In addition, she, is involved, she was involved in a five-year project working with 28 private colleges and universities in California to develop their capacity to sustain and monitor progress on institutional diversity. That project has resulted in a final report, three research briefs, and a resource kit for campuses and a, on a, and a monograph, making a real difference with diversity a guide to institutional change. Most recently, Smith has been a Fulbright Senior Specialist in South Africa. Please join me in a rousing welcome for our guest speaker for this morning's session, Dr. Daryl Smith. Good morning, everybody. I am so pleased to be here and kind of humbled to be here after listening to that video yesterday. Um, I got a copy of it in the late afternoon and what popped out at me most profoundly was the resilience of students who have a commitment to succeed and who get up every day, as the president said, and come and continue to work in spite of incredible challenges and odds. And that made me think about community colleges today and all of you. Because it seems to me that one of the things that's being called for today is resilience. Resilience not only for our students, but for each and every one of you and for our institutions that in the face of unbelievable challenges, we're gonna make this work. And in part because our future as a country depends on it. So let me, I want to sort of lay out today the way of thinking about diversity, which in some sense is parallel, can often be parallel to this conversation about student success, and how to think about this work in a way that moves us forward. The first thing I want to do is set a very broad context, and you're familiar with many of these, but it's very important that we tie this walking the talk of diversity, equity, and inclusion with student success and our, what is going on. And obviously, the first thing that's going on is an increasing awareness in the country about higher education and its role for the future. Student success and college attainment is now on most everybody's lips. And the President, the Lumina Foundation, many organizations have this 60% big goal that 60% of everybody in our society will have achieved some level of higher education. 
If you disaggregate the data for the country now, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on data today, what you see is we're not achieving that, and in many communities, we're far from it. We now know that the quality and success in higher education is going to be linked to the well-being of our society and our state. We already know that people can't find enough employees with the skills they need in the state. People are going out of the state. We're going out of our own country because we can't find people who have the kind of level of education we need. This is not only an individual issue. It's not only for the individual. It's also for the health and well-being of our society. Economic disparities in a society are not good. And just look around the world if you <coughs> question that. I also want to very much emphasize in your conversation about adversity today that we have 50 years of unfinished business with respect to equity issues in the society. And you'll see in a minute how our concepts of diversity are broadening, and you see that in the video. But we also have to remember that we have unfinished business <clears throat> with respect to historically underrepresented minorities in this society, and that while we've made progress, we haven't made enough progress. And that is why the demographics of our society and the changing demographics become so important. One of the things that's going on now is the entire, the credibility of higher education to deliver is on the line right now. And especially for community colleges. And as I was thinking about this talk today, I thought, this is kind of a paradox. You know, in, in, this, in the world of higher education, in the world of the country, community colleges have often been that invisible partner. Most people who work in community colleges feel, have felt underappreciated and not seen as often as they should, given its mission. Right? Is that true? So we walk around feeling, well, how come nobody pays attention to what we're doing? We're doing important work. Well, guess what? Now, people are paying attention. And the pressure is real. And of course, the paradox is, at the very moment that people are paying attention, up, we have a budget crisis. Isn't it lovely? People are paying attention just as they're taking money away saying it's even more important what you do as we give you less money to do it. This is a very strange world we live in, a bit schizophrenic, and you now have what you wanted, attention, pressure, and in some level a perverse kind of abandonment in our state. So there is a paradox going on here, and I think we have to be appreciative of it. We're also in the middle of all these accountability movements, and you know with accreditation, it is no longer okay to simply talk about student success and wonderful stories of student success. We have to ask the question, how do we know we're making progress? And while some of these mechanisms, like No Child Left Behind, really didn't really tap the things that we think of as key, it is also true, whether you're in K-12, whether you're in the community college, or whether the University of California or the CSU, the kind of success rates we've had in program completion, graduation, et cetera, are not up to the challenge. Those days have to be gone if we are serious about the kind of society we want to live in. At the same time, we're talking about historically underrepresented groups in higher education, we have expanding concepts of diversity, and you really saw that in this, in this uh, video. Immigration, issues of religion, language, more attention to indigenous communities, and particularly in Southern California, a community that really is very important in our history, in our present, that often doesn't get talked about because it's so small. Sexual orientation and gender identity. 10 years ago, we did not pay attention to gender identity. It's not that gender identity wasn't an issue 10 years ago, but you saw in the video. This is a moment, and it's an important moment. It adds to diversity, and it adds to the complexity of diversity. We are in the middle of a science and technology crisis. A little factoid for you. 87% of the Asians getting their PhDs in this country are non-citizens. 
What that means is we are not building our domestic capacity for science. We know this is an issue at K-12. There is some important work being done, I think here and in the community colleges around the country, to really begin to create the capacity to, to change this trajectory we're on. Because the rest of the world is building their higher education systems. We used to think that people would get their degree and stay here, so who cares if domestic folks didn't do it? Well, the truth is, higher education is growing around the world, and people are helping to build that. We need to build our domestic capacity. It's very clear as we think about diversity work that we have to think about multiplicity and intersectionality of identities. Very few of us live in one identity. If I asked you to list all the identities that matter to you, my experience is you might have 15. So we're thinking about race, class, gender, sexual orientation, all of these things play out to make the wonderful narratives that are in that video of individuals who have a very complex set of identities. We need to be aware of that as we move ahead with the issues of diversity. Access and success for those with disabilities. Very important, I'm about to go this week to Gallaudet University for the hearing impaired. This is an institution that's built its capacity so that people who are deaf and hearing impaired can navigate and thrive in a higher ed context. It's that model of how do we build that capacity so people have full access and can thrive in our environments. And of course, the changing demographics you know all about. This is California. You can see the Latino population, white population. This is a very diverse state. It is the future of the country. In fact, if you look at the country, it's already mirroring California. So the next generation work, for me, is, is not just thinking about individuals, but it's thinking about how do we build our capacity so we can serve our mission well. And it's building our capacity for a pluralistic society. And as the president said, we are in a pluralistic society. This isn't some future world. I think it means reframing how we talk about diversity. And it's really about our credibility, our viability, and our capacity to build an institution that can function in this world that is so pluralistic. And just to play a little mind game with you, I like to think about technology. When we understood that technology was an imperative in our society, what did we do? We changed almost everything we did, administrative processes. What would you think if you walked on a campus that didn't have wireless? I hope you have wireless. What would you think if you <laughs> What would you think if you walked on a campus that didn't have wireless? What? How can you function, right? But the interesting thing about the building our capacity for technology, because we understand it's an imperative, that it continues to change, yes? So five years ago, it's not like we said, when are we going to be done with technology? In the middle of a budget crisis and a financial downturn, have you added people who do social media? Because we understand it's an imperative. We may, we may not throw money at it the way we did 20 and 30 years ago. I remember those days and I used to think, oh, if we'd only do that for diversity. But the reality is, because we understand it's an imperative, it keep, we must keep up with it, our credibility will depend on it, and our skills and how we think about the skills you need are central to it. We keep building it, and we ask the questions, what do we need to do? The other thing about diversity uh, technology is, is it touches every element of our institution from facilities to hiring to enrollment to matriculation is there anything technology hasn't touched? Well, the same thing is true about diversity. And our real question is, what do we need to do to build our capacity to serve our mission? So the next generation of this work, I think, is gonna have some key metrics, essential elements associated. The first is that diversity has to be part of your mission. Now, in some sense, for a community college, access is your mission, and you've got 
diverse students. So you can go, all right, we do that. But what we know about higher education today and what we know about the community colleges, access is not sufficient. It is about access and success. That is your mission. So it's a core element that has to be thought about in every single day. It has to be part of core indicators of success, not parallel. You've already set a model for doing that here. I've seen some of your graphs, I'll show you some of them. We're talking about student success. So if we say academic progress, if we say completion of vocational course, if we say completion of developmental courses, all we're doing is disaggregating by race and gender. Who is succeeding? It's got to be beyond Project Titus toward coordination and synergy. And I want to underline that now because of the, precisely the point we are in financially. Our response to most diversity issues on most college campuses in this country, forgive me if I sound like I'm overgeneralizing, but I've been to a lot of campuses, we have an issue, we create a program. We come to a diversity meeting or a, any other meeting and we have a problem, we create a program. Yes, it, so I'm not speaking out of turn here. And then we look to the same few people who've been doing this work forever, because I'm assuming you're not adding staff at every time you create a program. And we say, okay, now we need a program. That's why on a lot of campuses, people stop showing up for diversity meetings because they already have full-time jobs. And in this environment, in this kind of a place, you have a full and a half-time job. Diversity has to be core to what is done. If we continue to think about it as we have an issue, we start a program, we will not be able to sustain it. And I don't care whether you're at Yale University or Long Beach City, you will not be able to sustain it. We have to monitor progress. We can have lovely stories, but the question is, how do we know we're making progress? How do we know we're succeeding? And that is something everybody in the institution has to be mindful of, not just the president, not just the accreditation officer. And diversity has to be inclusive, but it can be differentiated. When you think about all the identities that were in the video and that I listed, there are different kind of issues with different communities of folks. So it's not like we sit in a hiring committee and go, well, we've got our laundry list of diversity identities. There are different needs, different issues. We have to think about diversity as inclusive because why would I say I don't care about someone who's hearing impaired? Why would I do that? If I care about racial equity, why would I say I don't care about that kind of equity? That is our obligation, but it's different and we can handle complexity and multiplicity. This is the way I think about it, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it. As an institutional way of thinking about diversity and equity is to think about your mission, to think about access and success, to think about the climate of the campus. How do you feel? The president said very well, how people relate to one another creates a culture and a climate on a campus that infuses every element are you all working together for this mission that is so noble and so important? Or are you reflecting what we see in the rest of society? A, a lot of picking at each other. You know, this is a time when we have to come together. And so climate is very important. The third domain here is education. This is the core of what we do. And so it must be, how does the curriculum, how does the programs reflect 21st century education for a pluralistic society. And the fourth dimension for me is institutional viability and vitality, and that's your capacity. Who are the staff? Who are the faculty? What capacity do people have to educate, for example, in developmental courses? We know people can succeed, and we know a lot of people don't. What is our capacity? One of my little bugaboos, and forgive me if I give you a bugaboo, I go to too many campuses that have centers for teaching and learning. Do you have a center for teaching and learning? I see how to use iPad in the classroom. There's the technology. We don't ass assume that everybody knows how to use the iPad in the classroom. But what are we doing to build capacity for success in developmental courses, for the difficult dialogues? You know, you, you saw in your video, just imagine the conversations that need to happen among us all to live in the society we are now in. 
We need to build capacity. With technology, we never assume people just had it. We were intentional about building it. And as true with technology, we have to be intentional about building our capacity to function in a pluralistic society. Few of us have had that experience, and few of us have had a successful experience. Look at Los Angeles, not always the model. Look around the world, not always the model. So the challenge here today is, can you build that here? Can you create that environment, that institution? Your mission, you know, it's interesting. We talk about the multiple missions of the community college and how hard that is. The more I think about and kind of embed myself in thinking about community colleges, you've really got a pretty focused mission. Unlike the, uh, Berkeley has got to struggle with research and all of this stuff, your mission, student access and success and preparing your students for participation in a pluralistic society. Your core mission is about those students who are in your video. Yes, they may be in CTE or they may be in liberal arts and they may be poets and they may be doing auto mechanics. That's true of any campus, lots of, lots of academic areas. But your core mission is that these students thrive and succeed. And the way to think about diversity and excellence, are students from different groups succeeding? Are all students being prepared to function in a pluralistic society? What is the institution's capacity to educate successfully? Are faculty and staff from different groups thriving? How robust are institutional relationships with diverse communities? These are all excellence. That's what excellence means. So we shouldn't have to defend diversity. We shouldn't have to be defensive about it. It's core to excellence in these ways. Clearly, the mission of this place is student success. And I'm going to just show you your own data. And I want you to, this is the disaggregated by race and gender metrics that you've developed for student success. And I want to ask you, no matter what your role is, whether you know these data. So this is student progress and achievement by ethnicity over time. So this is your racial groups. This is for three different years from 2003 to 2006. And you see a gap there for African American and Latino students. Now what I know is that campuses that have been intentional about this work often find these students succeed as well or better than others. That is your goal. This is race and gender. Most campuses have a race and gender issue. Men aren't thriving to the degree that women are in most of our campuses. Females are blue in this chart. And this is by race. This is successful course completion rate for vocational courses. Again, by race, over time, I see progress within each group. And when you see progress, cheer. But you still have some issues of gaps between groups. Vocational skills course completions. Again, racial gaps. Race and not so much, well, little, little gender gap. And again, basic skills completion rates. This is race and gender. So, the real interesting question is, how many of you know these data now? Just show of hands. Don't be embarrassed. Pretty good. Yes? If you don't, and again, I don't care whether you're a staff member, working in academics, this is part of the way we say we're making progress or we're not. Those achievement gaps, given our society, must be eradicated. And I know from research that they can be. So, first of all, when done well, diversity has educational benefits. It, in fact, leads to cognitive complexity, otherwise known as critical thinking. When you put people together who come from diverse backgrounds in a shared experience, let's say a program or a course, people have to think in ways that interrupt patterns of thinking. Just take those students, imagine them putting them in a course and having a conversation. What they would teach each other about gender, about immigration, about uh, the society, about financial challenges, poverty, etc. Good education matters. If we want someone's zip code 
or part of Long Beach to predict their success, and I know Long Beach has pockets, if you want where people were born to predict their success, then higher education will continue to do what it does. If we interrupt those patterns with good education, what we learn is students succeed. And I think about a chair with four legs. So this is the, what research says, it's really high level. High expectations. The president said, we're not talking about lowering expectations for success. High expectations. We want excellence. Our society needs excellence. We need people who have a good education. Listen to this one. Belief in students' capacity, even when they don't believe in themselves. You're aware of students who walk around not believing in themselves. Your first person on that video basically talked about self-esteem. What I know is if we want students to succeed, we need to believe in them when they don't believe in themselves. So that every student who you encounter, whether it's on the grounds or in an office or wherever it is, is no doubt going to take a bump in the road as a sign they don't belong or a sign they can't do it. And all of our roles is to remind them they can even if they don't think they can. The third is the necessary support to get them there, and historically, community colleges have provided that with all kinds of ways. It's part of what lead us. And the fourth is important. It's a culture of success. And I don't know Long Beach City College well enough to know that if I walked around here, is this a culture of success where you're just aware that people here succeed, are expected to succeed, are supported to succeed, and that has to manifest itself, that culture, in the financial aid office, the admissions office, the, serp, the skills office, the grounds folks. You know, with many of our campuses, there's more diversity among our ground staff than there is in our faculty. And some of those folks are the ones watching out for students and giving them support and telling them they're going to do it. But a culture of success is very important, not reasons for failure, a culture of success. We know that commitment to diversity is important for success. It's, it turns out to be one of the predictors of success, that the institution has to, you have to feel that the institution is committed to success. We know now it's directly tied to excellence and accountability. And these other two points are very important, pivotal moments and pivotal people. There are moments in every student's life when something happens, well, in fact, it's true of all of our lives. I want you to think for a second about some moment in your life when you were ready to give up on something. Things were getting hard, and you were ready to give up. And imagine a moment where you ended up not giving up. I can bet you, I'd bet money, that there was a pivotal moment where a pivotal person stepped in. Is that true? When you look at the research on student success, you look at students, for example, who get PhDs who started in the community college, they will tell you about a pivotal faculty member. They could have been in voc ed, and someone said, why are you not doing philosophy, or vice versa. Pivotal moments and pivotal people. Faculty are huge. This isn't just the, the area of counselors who are overwhelmed and there aren't enough of them possibly to go around. It's everybody's job to kind of watch and say, you okay? And, and I think part of the obligation of a day like today is to say, I'm gonna watch, and I don't care if my job is the tech guy, or the maintenance guy, or woman, or the faculty member, or the person in the financial aid office. How are you doing? Need anything? Pivotal moments and pivotal people that have been responsible, you can just read and read and read, and you will find that that's what people trace their ultimate success to. And the community college, those who've been at community college will often trace their success to someone here. My three M's, mission, mattering, and multiplicity create healthy communities. You have to feel that we're here because of a shared mission. 
You have to feel that you matter. You have to feel that you matter. And students need to feel that they matter. And the multiplicity is simply they need to feel they matter in all their complexity, that we're not putting people in boxes. The world today is not a box world. It's a multiple world. So mission, mattering, and multiplicity. And myths and assumptions have to go away. We have more myths and assumptions related to diversity than I care to name. We have myths and assumptions about hiring. There aren't any, they wouldn't come here, we can't afford them, and they wouldn't stay. We have myths and assumptions about why students don't succeed. Now, if the email went down or your web went down, how long would you tolerate that? <laughs> Not long. <laughs> 10 minutes, 20 minutes? Now imagine someone came up and said, well, we just can't get that website up. Sorry. You know, it's very complicated, these web things. Sorry. Person wouldn't be around for very long, even though it might be really complicated. But listen to our discourse about diversity issues and student success, or hiring for that matter, and hear the reasons for failure, not the imperative for success. We must succeed. Our future depends on it. And if we, it's not to say that these students' lives aren't hard and some people might not make it through. But we have to set the conditions that increase the likelihood for success and not just regretfully feel the reasons for failure. And we need to set clear pathways. And I think this is one of the challenging times now. There, you could hear it in the students' voices. How do we set them up in these difficult times with classes and enrollment limits, et cetera? Can we figure out a way that it's not a nightmare just to get here? And what might that look like? So the implications for student success have to do with pedagogy. They have to do with the climate. They have to do with student engagement. They have to do with advising and connection, and I'm going to say intrusive advising. The days of just sitting in an office and waiting for someone to come can't be. We need intrusive advising. There's an article in Change Magazine a few years ago. It was called Pushy Pushy. You see someone in trouble, and again, I don't care what your role is, bring them in and ask if, what's going on and if you can help. The curriculum has to be changed for the 21st century, and that will depend on the program. Difficult dialogues are going to be an increasingly important imperative for all of us. Gateway courses, if we're serious about STEM, then we have to be serious, science, technology, engineering, and math. I use STEM and people say, what's that? The gateway courses. This is the place where all the people who want to be doctors or nurses get into a particular course. Most of us know what they are on our campuses. We know that revisions of pedagogy will improve success, not lower standards, but improve success. We need to identify them and change them, and the same with all the basic skills. Hiring is critical. Program design. Your attractiveness. In these days, we all want to be attractive because that's going to mean we have a viable program. And data. How do we know? At all levels of leadership, and we need all levels of leadership on this one. It's got to be tied to a framework like those dimensions I talked about. Monitoring progress, how do we know? These are intelligent metrics. The issue of completion is not a perfect metric. It's, it's not that it's not complicated. But in general, we know that part of our goal is for students to complete. And yes, the community college has lots of people entering for lots of reasons. So you know you're trying to clarify what are people's goals so you don't consider someone for transfer who's trying to do a CTE course or a certificate. We can do that. It's got to be central to mission in every unit. This issue of student access and success has to be felt. I don't care where you work here. Again, student success and hiring are two of the most important areas, two important metrics. Leadership is critical. This is about, at every level, this is what we're about, we're gonna do it in spite of, again, the paradox of being under such attention with so many fewer resources. Isn't this lovely? 
What I know about student success and institutional change with respect to diversity, it has to be intentional. It has to be aligned. We have to feel accountable and it must be sustained. And that's part of the issue with the problem of programs. We start them, then we stop them. It's just got, and we cannot keep adding to your work. It, it just can't be an on top of. It has to be, if my job has anything to do with our mission, how do I do that but take diversity into account? And we must be inclusive and differentiated. A conversation about equity and inclusion with historic issues on historically underrepresented minorities cannot be lost in a laundry list. But that veteran population, learning disabled population, need to be part of that conversation. And again, we are capable of handling multiplicity. The reality is that the urgency is increasing. It's not getting less. Our future is a society, and I, can, I can't say this passionately enough, the society I want to live in, this pluralistic society, doesn't get replicated around the world. We see what happens around the world. The urgency for diversity and inclusion, student success, is increasing. We cannot afford reasons and excuses and the reality is that community colleges, whether we like it or not, must, must stand for its role because you are the nexus of the future of our society. So I call you all to do that, to remember why you came here. I would, everybody I've ever talked to who's come to a community college has come because of this mission. You didn't come because it was easy but you came because it was compelling. And on this day and going forward, there is no question that the society is not acting like it gets why you're so important. We're in this very weird schizophrenic stage. Education's more important, but we won't invest in it. Sounds crazy to me, but <laughs> it's the stage we're in. But the reality is every student who crosses your door has a future that depends on you. But more critically, our society will depend on the work of community colleges and the work here. Thank you very much.